If you're driving in the car right now, look down at your feet. No, w- wait, wait. On second thought, uh, don't do that. You you probably know what's on the floor, uh, on the driver's side anyway. If your car is a standard, the pedals from left to right go clutch, brake, accelerator. If it's an automatic, it's brake, then accelerator, left to right. And that's the way it is in every car made in the world today. It doesn't matter which side the steering wheel is on, the pedals are always laid out the same from left to right on every car. But a hundred years ago, in the early days of the automobile, it wasn't always like this. Sometimes the accelerator was in the middle. Sometimes it was on the left. Sometimes it was on the steering wheel. Here's a secret. The first car with the pedal layout that we have today was probably a 1912 Cadillac, or at least as far as we can tell. That spread throughout the company and then on through Chevrolet and other GM cars. And from there, everybody eventually adopted that particular arrangement. Here's one more. If you're driving an automatic, the transmission settings are like this. Park, reverse, neutral, drive, then low. You might have low one and low two, but it's essentially the same. P-R-N-D-L. And that's the same standard worldwide. Why? Well, 60 years or so ago, a lot of cars had different layouts for their automatic transmissions. GM cars often used park, neutral, drive, low, reverse. Some, like my friend's old 1963 Chrysler Saratoga, had transmission buttons on the dash. This was confusing and dangerous. It was far too easy to slip it into reverse when you thought you were going into drive. And there were many, many accidents. The U.S. government took notice and passed a law, thereafter known as U.S. Department of Transportation Standard Number 102, And it stated that the order of gears on automatic transmissions must always be park, reverse, neutral, drive, low. And since America called the shots with the auto industry back then, this law became our universal standard. So now you know a secret about your car. Let's move on to something more. This is The Secret History of Rock with Alan Cross. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and I get a lot of questions about record collections. And the questions usually go something like this. I want to make sure that I have all my bases covered. Which 10 albums do I absolutely need to own? Well, that depends on personal tastes, of course. If you're talking about rock and roll in general, you need some Beatles, some Stones, some Led Zeppelin, that sort of thing. But since my area is in the realm of alternative rock, I get asked about which records are essential to that collection. Now, I'm going to warn you right now because some of what you're about to hear may be a bit unfamiliar, but that's okay because you're here because you love music and you want to get deeper into it and learn more, right? So just stay with me, okay? Alternative rock evolved as a separate but parallel universe with mainstream rock. While most of the world was listening to the sort of rock that descended from when the blues Rhythm and blues, country and western, folk and hillbilly all merged in the early 1950s. It took until the middle 1960s for an alternative to that approach to emerge. Mainstream rock and alternative rock lived parallel but separate lives, occasionally intersecting but staying mostly apart. Then along came Nirvana in 1991 and ripped a hole in the space-time continuum. After that, alternative dominated much of the 90s, pushing old-school rock aside. During that time, it wasn't cool to be both into alternative rock and the regular mainstream stuff. It was very, very tribal, and the tribes tended to be in a state of constant war. But in the 21st century, thanks largely to how music fans have been empowered with personal technology like MP3 players, we've seen a truce and another merging of tastes. And now it's totally okay to like both the Beatles and, say, uh, the Black Keys. But if we're really going to understand how this second universe, the alternative universe, came to be... It's very helpful to make a list of 10 must-have records from that scene. Think of this as a musical wardrobe, one with all the essentials, or uh, maybe a wine cellar stocked with the appropriate varieties of reds and whites. Here are those albums in chronological order. We'll begin with the first Velvet Underground album. It's officially called The Velvet Underground and Nico. This record is widely regarded as the very first alt-rock record. Since it was released in March of 1967, its DNA has spread. Punk, glam, new wave, goth, lo-fi, industrial, dream pop, and pretty much 
Every other form of non-mainstream rock owes something to this record. It was also one of the very first rock and roll records to deal with adult themes like uh, raw sex and unvarnished descriptions of drug abuse. And it's very important to put that into context. This album was recorded in 1966 in eight hours over two days. At most, rock was, I don't know, just about 15 years old. 99% of the music being made was about cars and girls. The notion of a rock album was actually still very new. Albums, 33 and a third RPM records, were reserved for good music like uh, classical and jazz and Broadway cast recordings. The kids, well, they got their music on 45 RPM singles. But here's the Velvet Underground with their weird Andy Warhol association singing about drugs and hookers and kinky sex and strange street people. No cars and girls, no hippie folk songs about peace and love, no metaphors and veiled references. This was a record full of sex and drugs and very raw rock and roll. It was rare enough to see this stuff in movies and novels back then, and you never, ever saw it on television. To those who thought rock was just for teeny boppers were, uh, well, they were scared by this album. I mean, these people were singing about this weird stuff. 